brothers and sisters, and welcome to the 2019 Convocation of the Canadian Reformed Theological Seminary. It is wonderful that we can gather here this evening to also celebrate a milestone, the 50th anniversary, the starting of this seminary. As we begin this evening, let us come before the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, Father in heaven, on the evening of this day, beginning of this time together, we come before your throne of grace. We give you thanks for bringing us safely here from far and near. We thank you for the many blessings that we have received through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for this awesome gift. Indeed, it's on the basis of his atoning work that all blessings flow. Also, the blessing of your church gathering work. And we see evidence of this this evening as we are here. As we come from far and near, also from across oceans. Indeed, your son is gathering one holy Catholic church. And part of that church gathering work seen in the blessing of the seminary. Much beloved seminary that we have. It has existed for 50 years. The humble beginnings and challenges along the way. Let's remember those of the first hour and those who have succeeded them and those who are now serving as professors. We thank you for the faithful instruction through these past 50 years. We thank you for the many students that have come through the seminary. They were equipped for service, go out into the churches, into the mission fields, and serve around this world. What a blessing we have from your hand. We see your goodness, your grace. And Father, we also thank you that we have support for the seminary from Australia. We thank the brothers and sisters there for their ongoing support. And, and there too, we see your faithfulness. We also thank you for the special relationship we may have with the churches in South Africa seminary we could be of support to them and father we pray that these relationships may continue under your care and under your guidance and father we also as we look back may be thankful for the support of the churches We thank you for the close connection, the bond between the seminary and the churches, churches of the Canadian Reformed Federation. Also thank you for this past year, for the faithful instruction that could be given. And we pray that you would continue to bless our professors and their spouses and families. We also think of those who have previously served as professors and their spouses. This time we think of our sister Deddens in the Netherlands, and advanced in years, and we pray for your continued care of her. Also our sister Margaret Young here in Hamilton. She continues alone, Father. Will you uphold her and strengthen her? That she may continue to be a blessing in the midst of your people. Think at this time of Emeritus Professor Nicochus and his wife Dini. Brothers in need of very much care each day again. And we thank you for that care that he receives. Will you continue to bless him and his wife Dini, who's there at his side in support? We're also grateful that this evening Professor Kirchner could be in our midst. And you have been also with him in this past year. 
and provided for him also with respect to health and strength. Will you bless him for the time ahead? And also grateful for Professor and Sister Keith and Joanne Van Dam. And brother has been able to continue to work so fruitfully in the midst of your churches in preaching and teaching and in writing. And thank you for your care and also upon the staff. We ask that you would also bless them as they embark into a new season of instruction, that they may be of support to those who teach. And Father, so we pray for an enjoyable evening together as we reflect upon the blessings received these past 50 years. There are some here this evening who were here 50 years ago. There too we see faithful support from the churches. And Father, we pray that you will also be with us as we have a graduation ceremony, as we once again witness the graduation of students, and we conferring of degrees and diplomas, May this evening serve for the glory of your name. Will you look upon us now in grace and mercy and hear us in our Savior's name. Amen. On a special occasion like this, we do receive letters of congratulations, of greetings. At this time, we receive one letter from the churches, it came from the Willoughby Canadian Reformed Church in Langley, B.C. I will not read this letter, but I will convey to you uh, an excerpt of this letter, which I think is most appropriate for this evening as we are here to celebrate. Let me read the last paragraph of this letter, sent from the Church in British Columbia. It is our prayer that the work of this institution will continue to be blessed by the Lord so that many more men may be made ready to proclaim the kingdom of God and teach about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance throughout the world until he returns. At this time, I would also like to give opportunity for the deputies from the Free Reformed Churches of Australia and the Free Reformed Churches of South Africa to pass on their greetings on this very happy occasion. I would first ask that Gerard Huff from the churches in South Africa come forward and followed by then Bruce Heisinger from the Reformed Churches of Australia. students and brothers and sisters, it's a great joy for me to be here tonight, seeing so many brothers and sisters in the Lord and being able to convey the congratulations from the churches in South Africa and the <coughs> deputies theological training in South Africa. From our side, obviously, we congratulate the CRTS for its 50th anniversary. In 1969, it was a small beginning, but it has grown to a mature institution that served Reformed churches throughout the world. Today, in 2019, by world standards, the CRTS is still a small institution. But for the head of the church, our Lord Jesus Christ, numbers do not count, but faithfulness to Him and His unchanging word. And today, we also from South Africa, from all our encounters with the CRTS, we can testify that he has kept his promises and sustained the seminary in its training of theological students in the true faith. Through you, he provides pastors for his flocks all over the world. Pastors who have been thoroughly equipped in all aspects of the ministry. I think. We all know that for many years we had 
to depend on the reformed churches liberated in the Netherlands and their theological university camp and to get our pastors trained. During the last decade, however, we had to go through a painful process of cutting our ties with company more and more. But our gratitude to the Lord is great for the fact that he also during the same decade gave us the ties with CRTS and becoming stronger all the way. The Lord closed one door for us and at the same time opened another one. We are using material from the CRTS in the training of our students. Some of our students will come to CRTS in the years to come, God willing. And we thank you, brothers, professors, for making yourself available for teaching at least two to three weeks a year, one by one, uh, to our students. And we know with exhaustingly full programs, as an isolated bond of churches, whenever there is a foreign uh, minister or professor in our midst, we count the nights and that's the number of lectures we hope the person is willing to be given to the churches and during the day to the students. The free from churches in South Africa are currently in a vulnerable position in more than one aspect. It's a small bond of churches with a number of vacancies within a country that goes through severe economic and political stress. But daily, we see how the Lord provides. The strengthening of ties with both the CRTS and the Canadian Reformed Churches mean very much to us. We look forward to our cooperation in the coming years and the worldwide service of our Lord. May he, from his heavenly throne, bestow his gifts abundantly on your institution and the many churches that you serve. In conclusion, I would like to quote Psalm 115, verse 1. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory, because of your mercy, because of your truth. Also on behalf of the uh, theological training in South African churches, congratulations to the students who will receive their MD status tonight and we pray that you will be able to use what you learned here fruitfully in the years to come. Thank you. 50 years is a long time and you deserve a gift. Um, on behalf of the churches in South Africa, uh, we would like to, it's a small token, but we hope it will hang on the walls of the seminary and when people see it, they will remember us. And uh, hopefully this will be a uh, good reminiscence of our relationship. Thank you very much. Thank you. ceremony and the golden jubilee of the Canadian Reformed Theological Seminary. To you all, on behalf of the Free Reformed Churches of Australia, I extend greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We share tonight the joy of seven students having completed their academic studies and being presented as graduates. We congratulate you all. And brothers, we wish you God's indispensable blessing in the awesome but joyous task before you. To all, the work of the seminary remains very close to the hearts and minds of those across the waters in Australia. We remain immensely thankful that we could, in good faith, send many prospective students to the seminary over the years. The bonds of mutual trust and respect have certainly strengthened over the last half century. To paraphrase John Kelvin, the Australian churches have sent their Jarrah wood and have received back chiselled arrows. 
some proclaiming the gospel with a familiar Aussie inflection, and, as, and just as many with a Canuck twang. We have tasted the fruit of your labours in your seminary in numerous ways, and we have been tremendously blessed. As Australian churches, we are aware of the unique blessing that the seminary experiences, that the experience provides for foreign students. It's true, the tyranny of distance is very real for those leaving behind family, friends and the familiar. Not to mention for going Vegemite, Tim Tam, Test Cricket and the best beaches and weather in the world. <laughs> However, offset against that sacrifice, both great and small, I know that the current Australian contingent from the Antipodes have expressed a heartfelt appreciation for the opportunities that they experience at the seminary. As Australian churches, we've also been blessed by the theological expertise provided over the years by the professors and their visitors. Recently, we welcomed Dr. Van Fleet to our shores where he spoke on the beauty of reformed worship and the image of God. We appreciated his commitment to a busy speaking schedule and visiting. We are thankful also for the time that we could spend also with Reverend Aisman as deputies to discuss the scope and possibility of theological training on our own continent. Before I finish, however, may I, may I for a moment meander down memory lane. On a personal note, I pass on sincere congratulations to the college from my father, Reverend Weeks Hudinger. Now Minister Emeritus of the Church of Armidale, my father was privileged to be part of the first graduating class in 1971. And he remembers with great fondness the bond that existed between the staff and the students as together they embarked on the journey of teaching and learning as a new theological seminary. With solemnity, he recalls, however, the difficulties that were placed on the path of the seminary. The sudden passing away of Reverend Van Popter before his appointment as professor and the passing of Professor Cullinan shortly into the academic year. He remembers, though, the Lord's grace in providing for the college at this time, allowing other godly men to continue when that, where they left off when called to their eternal home. My father also wishes to honour the Dr. Faber in particular for the enormity of his contribution to the college. And whilst there were some tough years, there was also joy and laughter amidst the hard work. How, for example, the seminarians, they boarded at the Queen Street Manor House under the auspices of the housekeeping inspector extraordinaire, Mrs. L. Sellis, who ensured they properly dusted every corner of every room, testing the quality control by running her fingers across the tops of the doors. <laughs> this and other such fond memories were indicative of the spirit of harmony that existed in those early years. On behalf of the Australian churches, I once more congratulate you on the seminary's 50th anniversary, and may he continue to bless all endeavours in training ministers and missionaries who boldly bring the gospel to all nations. With the prophet Isaiah we say, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, and who says to Zion, your God reigns. Thank you. Thank you, brothers, for your greetings and your congratulations. And speaking of congratulations, after the ceremony this evening, you will have the opportunity to congratulate the graduates. I've been told that they will be in the gym, and there will be separate lines for each of the graduates. Feel free to choose whom you would like to see first. And so different lines are going to be formed. And please keep your congratulations brief so that the lines may move faster. I'd like to continue then with the reading of God's Word, and in connection with the keynote address by Dr. Conralti, I'd like to read from Paul's letter to the Colossians, reading from Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Colossians 2, verse 1 through 10, beginning at verse 1, there we read, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, 
in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. So far the reading of God's word. At this time then I would declare that the 50th anniversary and the 45th convocation is open. Chairman of the Board, Governors, Brothers and Sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, this part of the Convocation evening is traditionally called a word from the principal. This evening we're going to change that slightly and call it some words from some principles and some others as well. Don't worry, I think you'll catch on as we go along. Let's begin in 1968. It was before our seminary even existed. General Synod Orangeville was in full session and Reverend G. Van Doren was busy reporting for the Canadian Reformed magazine. Remember, no Twitter feeds, no live stream back then. This is what he wrote on November the 25th. The matter of the training for the ministry has proved to be the big issue. At this moment, we cannot say much. There has been a meeting of the governors the whole day. Tonight there is a session behind closed doors. Suspense is in the air. Can you feel it? On November the 27th, he continued, after two days of secret session, the Synod finally opened its doors to the public consisting at that moment of only one lady, our faithful Jenny, the Synod's typist, who representing the whole Canadian Reformed community heard the following proclamation by the President of the Synod. After extended discussions and deliberations, Synod has decided to replace the present provisional setup of the training of the ministry by a regular theological college with three full-time professors and two part-time lecturers. Now, brothers and sisters, it's hard to fully imagine, let alone recapture, the kind of excitement that must have rippled through the bond, the Federation of Churches, after that presidential proclamation. But it was there in 1968. Of course, the first hour of any span of history is special, unique. You can't turn back the clock. By now, the so-called regular theological college has become a regular part of our ecclesiastical furniture. But by the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit, may our first love for this seminary continue to burn brightly. Because I'm sure that during those two days of secret session, the delegates at the Synod of Orangeville were thinking a lot about the elect lady and her children. As the Apostle John writes in his second late letter, the elect lady, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, it was for the church, it was by the church, 
that the seminary was being set up, and that's still why it exists today. And all of this under the unforgettable, the indispensable blessing of our Lord. Without him, seminary would have never started. Without him, it would not be here today. Without him, it cannot go forward. But with him, we can step forward, and we can do so with excitement. Now some words from our first principal, Dr. Yella Faber. It was the official opening of the Theological College on Wednesday, September the 10th, 1969. In his inaugural speech, Dr. Faber argued persuasively that a seminary that fully submits to the Word of God, that a seminary that also embraces sincerely the creeds and the confessions of the Church, such a seminary will prevent itself from becoming narrow-minded. Here's how he said it. Is the establishment of this seminary a continuation of sectarianism? No. Not when we consider the foundation of our seminary. In the context, he was speaking about the confessional foundation. It is our truly ecumenical task, he continued, to maintain that foundation in all our teaching. Then we are not narrow-minded, but we find ourselves in the worldwide and age-old communion of the Catholic Church. By the grace of God, after five decades, CRTS stands on that same foundation. Our basis, posted publicly on our website, is this. CRTS submits to the doctrine of the infallible Word of God as summarized in the ecumenical creeds and the Belgian Confession, the Heidelberg Catechism, and the Canons of Dort. And now look. Look at how the Lord has blessed us. Blessed us with a Catholic worldwide opportunity to serve his kingdom. Over the years, CRTS has been privileged to train students from these different countries, including Canada, the United States of America, Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, the Philippines, Singapore, Korea, China, South Africa, Sudan, Russia, Poland, and Italy, and I may have overlooked a couple. 50 years ago, at the opening ceremony, who there could have ever imagined such a thing? Today, the Lord is doing it. And in part, he's doing it through a most remarkable cooperation of federations of churches separated by thousands upon thousands of kilometers, and yet they're joined. As the Belgian Confession says, they're joined with heart and will in the same spirit. I'm referring to our long-standing cooperation with the Free Reformed Churches of Australia, our more recent collaboration with the Free Reformed Churches of South Africa. Here's another quote, back in 1988, also from Dr. Faber. Over the course of the years, we've received monies collected by the Australian brothers and sisters, he said. Now this financial support has been formalized in a most generous manner. But more important than the financial help is the fact that in the last decades, the sister relationship between the Free Reformed Churches of Australia and our Canadian Reformed Churches has been strengthened. Indeed, that's exactly it. Of course, the financial support is much appreciated, but it's the relationship. In the past few years, I've had the immense privilege of traveling to the churches both in Australia and South Africa. Brothers and sisters, perhaps you will allow me to wax just a bit emotional here for a moment. 
but the discussions, the fellowship, the communion with the brothers and sisters in those two countries, in those two federations, was sweet. Sweet to the soul. As the psalmist says, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Oh, we wrestled with some big questions. We didn't come up with all the answers. But the atmosphere, the atmosphere in which we talked, in which we spoke, in which we worshipped and prayed together, truly humbling, a work of the Holy Spirit. But what is a seminary without students? Some years ago, the principal before me, Dr. Fisher, published some comments from our international students in Clarion. Here's just one sample. I'm learning a lot of things being at the college, wrote one, both in class and out. Sometimes I feel this is the first time I hear about theology, and I can't wait to go back and apply everything I've learned at the college. That was an international student. We often hear comments like this from our students, and thankfully so. This evening we welcome seven new students. Six of them enter the MDiv program, studying for the Ministry of the Word. Caleb Goss, near Landy, Alberta. Mark van der der Linde. Winnipeg, Manitoba. Adam Workman, Winnipeg, Manitoba. Matthias Scott, Mundijan, Western Australia. Timothy Slaw, Smithers, BC. And Faustin Amadjo, from Cameroon in Africa via Germany to Hamilton. We also extend a warm welcome to one new M uh, BTH student, Dan Deary from Brantford, Ontario. Welcome to you all. A total of seven graduating students this evening, seven, seven coming in. The student body stays stable at 24. The same time as we briefly review our history this evening, we must acknowledge difficult moments. We go back to the beginning, 1968. Reverend Jules Stephen Popta was appointed to be the first professor of dogmatics. In the Lord's plan, he never delivered his first lecture. Instead, the Lord took him to glory. Another appointment was made. The Theological College opened its doors on September the 15th, 1969. Not even three weeks later, October the 4th, seminary community was again shocked with grief. The Lord took another professor, Francois Cowenhoven, out of his earthly labors into heavenly rest. Decades later, in another heart-wrenching series of events, first Dr. Jack Dion, then Dr. Nick Coaches, had to stop teaching at our seminary due to dementia. Yet through these hardships, the Lord has sustained us. I'd like to go back to that synod. After the sudden death of Reverend J. T. Van Popta, at that general synod in 1968, the chairman paused to address the assembly was Reverend W. W. J. Venuni. He spoke comforting words to the assembly. These are the final sentences. The Lord did not deem it necessary that Reverend Van Popta knew of his appointment, that he decided about it, that he did any work for it. We shall have to continue without him, knowing and trusting that it is the Lord who bids us to continue and who will take care of his church. And thus, we shall continue following after our King and Savior, Jesus Christ, his mercy we implore, his help we ask. But it's only appropriate that the final quotation comes from the inspired scriptures, the Apostle Paul. The entire 50-year history of this seminary, brothers and sisters, can be summed up in one verse. 
Romans 11, verse 36. For from him, and through him, and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I've had the privilege of giving this address to you from a very beautiful lectern. Those of you who have been at previous convocations may have noticed that this looks new. It is. This is a most generous gift from all of the alumni, all of the graduates over 50 years of this seminary. They have gathered some funds and given this beautiful lectern to the seminary to be used in the senior classroom. On behalf of the seminary, I would like to thank the alumni heartfeltly and ask anyone who has studied, graduated from the seminary here present to rise at this moment so that we may also express our appreciation to you. If you're an alumnus, please rise. Stephen Dam to come forward for the commemorative book presentation. Brothers and sisters, the Lord has richly blessed us as a seminary, and we are so thankful for his gifts over the last 50 years. Now, as a token of gratitude, the seminary community has come together to put together this commemorative book. This book is chock full of all kinds of interesting history, including the ups and the downs, the tensions and the reliefs that were experienced during the years, the joys and the sorrows. But above all, this book is a tremendous testimony to the faithfulness and love of our Heavenly Father. Through the past 50 years, he has sustained us as churches so that we could maintain this training for ministers of the word. Now before this evening started, you were supposed to have seen some pictures on the screens. Now this book contains many, many more pictures. Now perhaps you're wondering how your minister looked like when he was a student. <laughs> Chances are you may find out if you look into this book. Some of the pictures may surprise you, but interested in history? I would say it's all here in the book. Now I've been asked to remind you that this book is available in the gym after the convocation. You can pay with cash or check or even with a credit card, just tap it and it's done. <laughs> so that's the sales pitch. <laughs> a final comment. I was privileged to be part of the first student body in 1969, along with others. And in view of my long involvement with the seminary, it gives me tremendous joy to be able to present on behalf of the entire seminary community this commemorative book to the Chairman of the Board of Governors, Reverend Lowerson.
So I'm sure you all wonder what it's like to sit up at the front here. Well, there is a way to get up here, but it takes a few years of education. But one thing they don't teach you is what to do with these hats. When do you wear it and when do you not wear it? And how many of you keep a record of which professor keeps it on and which one takes it off? We may have to appoint a committee to figure that out, but if, um, if those who do make the pictures here keep photoshopping my hair grayer, I'm going to wear my cap every year and keep it on. Now I should also show you how cool this thing is. Down and up. This is Dr. Smith height. This is Dr. Fisher height. <laughs> tonight about the hunger for a good order among mission churches. And as I thought about that, I thought, where to begin? There are so many stories to tell. But let me begin with Psalm 119, verse 105, and then relate the stories. 119, 105 is right here in Latin. Your word is a lamp to my feet and the light for my path. This is your word my light, in Latin. It's on there. It is. So Psalm 119, 105 is the motto of the seminary. There is no chapter of the Bible that praises God's written instructions more highly than Psalm 119. Go through the psalm. The psalmist treasures God's law, obeys his decrees, hides God's word in his heart, rejoices to follow his statutes, meditates upon his precepts, considers God's ways, and delights in God's instruction. Those are all quotations. He calls God's word his counselor, his delight, full of wonders, true, righteous, eternal, boundless, more precious than thousands of pieces of silver and gold, sweeter than honey and a lamp to his seat and a light for his path. That's just a smattering of the great praises that the psalmist sings for the instruction of God for his holy word. His heart overflows with the joy of a freed man. Verse 32, I run in the path of your commands for you have set my heart free. And he enjoys a settled and peaceful conscience in his heart. Seven times a day I praise you for your righteous laws. Great peace have those, have they, who love your law, and nothing can make them stumble. At the just-completed General Synod 2019 of our churches, the chairman presented the convening church with a large signboard displaying the text. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things out of your law. Psalm 119, verse 18. Sometimes Psalm 119 seems overly zealous or overly optimistic about God's instructions, especially if you approach it by wrongly dividing law and gospel and think of Psalm 19 as only that law that accuses. You could never make sense of it. But if you read Psalm 19 with a heart of faith, with love for God filling you, with the heart of Jesus who said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord, then as you read this psalm, your heart will sing, it will soar into the heavens, and it will rest in the bosom of the Lord. And I submit to you that this is the right place to begin when speaking about good order among mission churches. If I said that I was going to talk about the topics that my colleagues at CRTS teach, such as Old and New Testaments, theology or dogmatics, or even ministry and mission, you would all readily expect me to begin with God's Word, that it's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. But good order, church government, Nitpicky things like whether or not we may sing songs in our worship services outside of those we as churches have already approved and adopted. 
Does the Bible even have anything to say about that? And how is it even possible to derive good order from the example of the mission churches of the New Testament so long ago in a totally different culture? Rick Warren's bestseller, The Purpose Driven Series, and particularly here I'm thinking of a purpose driven church, says that the Bible teaches us the contents of the faith, but we get to figure out the methods. And his pragmatic approach leads him to say, when a church continues to use methods that no longer work, it is being unfaithful to Christ. And he also states that his church called everything an experiment and tried more things that didn't work than things that did. Now, we agree, we agree, surely, that there is room for trying this or that outreach project, but is God's word so silent that our basic approach is to be pragmatic? When we read that God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light for our path, doesn't that mean that it shows us the way we should go? the practices we should follow, the methods to use. And that leads me to a few stories. First, from the North American movement of the young, restless, and reformed, as Colin Hansen memorably described it in his book in 2008. This movement considered itself to be missional within North America. And for some time, the fine work of D.A. Carson, R.C. Spruill, John Piper and John MacArthur had paved the way, and I'm not endorsing everything that they taught or teach, just saying that they push evangelicalism into a broadly reformed direction. You know, the sovereignty of God, the atoning work of Christ, and so on. By 2008, in the eight years that followed, other prominent leaders like Mark Driscoll, Bill Hybels, He's not quite so much in the same category, but James McDonald, C.J. Mahaney, Joshua Harris, and Tully and Chavijan were publishing books as fast as possible, appearing at conferences all over North America, directing the affairs of their mega churches, and forming new mega organizations. Churches, even our sister churches in the Netherlands at the time, sent pastors and elders to learn firsthand the great successes of these men and their churches. <coughs> However, of the six men that I named last, at least three of these men had about zero theological education. Most of them, especially one, were making scads of money. At least one learned his ministry methods from the stage and from business leaders as much as from the scriptures. That's what he told us. And it turned out that behind the scenes, at least half of them were power-hungry, controlling, and manipulative. The adultery of one was only discovered after he told the world that his wife had committed adultery. Another tried to get his wife to take the fall for his temper tantrums by saying that she had not been there when he needed her. It makes me angry just remembering that interview. And another was using posters of his elders' wives with points on them for pellet gun target practice, I kid you not. The most honest one of the bunch has left the faith altogether and said so. The others have all been disgraced for various reasons, ranging from adultery to fraud, plagiarism, mishandling of abuse cases, and controlling behavior. Two have tried to claw their way back and start a new church. Um, each case is a story all on its own. And thankfully, the Christian press, such as World Magazine, has been exposing these men and their ministries. We must critique our own. In the broad sense, I say they are our own. And we must be ahead of the world in discovering sin among ourselves. We need good order. Long ago, the churches of the Reformation warned each other in their acts of provincial and national synods about men who wandered around claiming to be preachers, but teaching error, living in sin, or simply fleecing the churches of money. So prior to cameras, text messages, and the internet, the churches would describe these men, sometimes memorably. For instance, there's a list of 24 men who are called vagrants and deposed ministers of the French Reformed churches. 
in the Acts of their Synod in 1563, and it includes this. A great lubberly Franciscan friar who abandoned his flock in the castle of Lord de la Martiniere. He is called La Motte. So that's a description, so if you see him, don't let him on your pulpit. Now why take such care? Well, the worst part is how the faith of so many under the influence of bad men, sometimes even when they meant well, has been hurt or destroyed. These men brought chaos into the church instead of order. Some were plainly, by their own writings, telling us that they were inventing the structures as they grew, sometimes doing their best out of scripture study, almost always disconnected from the historic Reformed church, and at other times doing so to benefit themselves and lacking accountability. And each example is the opposite of Colossians 2 verse 5, which is in your programs where the apostle wrote, I delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So you hear good order and firmness of faith go together just as disorder and weakness of faith go together. And those left behind are crying out for good order. I don't have time for a series of further examples, but let me mention that in Brazil there are former Pentecostal churches that have discovered the Reformed faith and will tell you over and over what a difference it has made for their church life and structures to join the Reformed churches of Brazil. There are churches overseas that ask us to come and lecture about church polity. There are house churches that desperately need to work together. Others send their students to us not just for a theological education, but to experience an orderly church life. There is a hunger for good order among mission churches, for accountability, for protection of the pastors and the flocks, and for meaningful cooperation and assistance among churches. The events described have created a crisis that cries out for something better. And by God's mercy, we must humbly acknowledge that he has blessed the Reformed churches with a very stable understanding of the principles of church government, taken from scripture itself and worked out in a way that can be used in virtually any time and culture. And of course, all the people who are practicing it are still sinners, and the good order is not always followed. But let's keep this in mind that our church order is not merely our own Canadian Reformed church order. It is the order that has been adopted by churches all over the world, with scriptural roots, patterns from the early church, sort of the, like the representative synodical pattern, just as one example. But, and with the rediscovery of these things in the Reformation, we have an order that can function very well. And this is especially because the federation of equal churches bonding together or covenanting together arose out of the persecution-heavy situation in France and then subsequently in the Netherlands. And so it didn't depend on any kind of government approval. And it can be used all over the world. Now at the same time, the spirit of the age in North America wants us as Reformed churches to stop being so overbearing and regulative. Relax. Give freedom. Well, two things should be said in response. The first one is vitally important, and when we lose this, we lose the whole sense of what church order is about. The church order of the Reformed churches quite simply records the decisions and desires of those very churches about how they want to govern themselves. Based on scripture, of course. But it is the decisions and desires of those churches that forms their order, and no one is being overbearing or overly regulative. That's a fundamental misunderstanding of what a church order just is. If your church is in federation, it's your own church order. Nobody imposes it on you. And second, Reformed churches have always implicitly recognized in their church orders the propensity for the sins of pride, of greed, and personal dominance. Charisma oozing pastors may look and sound great in our era of soundbite theology, 
And when you can, you can watch them any time in every sermon they give. But the church, the local assembly of believers, is run in the day-to-day -day grind of simple but faithful pastors, elders, and deacons doing their task in a sacrificial way. It may be unnoticed, but it is glorious. And that's why we have many checks and balances in the way that office bearers work together and in the way that churches mutually guard each other. This is why the path to the ministry is long and arduous. The churches want as much assurance as possible that these men are well equipped, have learned from our forefathers how to handle rightly the word of God, and are willing to submit to what we have agreed to in our church order. I don't mean that as a defense of arduous exams that the students have to write at the seminary necessarily. That may be a part of it. But what's the bottom line about why we approach things this way? Well, here it is. Your word, my light. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That's why Psalm 119.105 guides, guides us in our church polity as well. Whatever God's word addresses, it addresses with divine authority. And we must live also, and really especially in our church life, by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. And so the hunger for good order doesn't emerge simply negatively from the bad examples that I gave, but fundamentally it emerges positively from the Spirit of God working in God's people, making them seek maturity and peace, which you can only find where you love good order. Positively, the hunger for good order is a faith response. And the fundamental principles of the Reformed Church order come from the Word of God. There, Christ teaches us that He is the only head of the church. And He shows us that there is no intermediary, intermediary authority between Himself and the local consistory. This local consistory, then, as another principle, consists in a plurality of elders ruling together, not one man. And thus, it then implies that no office bearer rules over another, and no church rules over another. Those are actually the, that was the first article of the first French church order and the first article of the Dutch church order, the first one in 1571. Christ rules over all, and situations of persecution help the churches of the Reformation recognize the biblical nature of these structures, but the source is clearly biblical. And we don't have time to go into that in detail now, of course. At the same time, our Lord clearly teaches us that these churches will be filled with rejoicing when they find churches of like faith and discover these churches and recognize them as God's work. God himself has put them together as churches and now they must govern their lives together for the good order and firmness of faith of all their members. That's the proper beginning of all church federation. It is rooted in the word of God. And in the context of that good order, instruction becomes possible. And in the context of good instruction, maturity and unity can follow, as, it's, as we're taught in Ephesians 4. And of this, by God's grace, there are many good counterexamples for which we thank the Lord. You're in a, just a small but simple church that wants to follow the word of God and binds itself to do so and has a good order and is bonded with other churches of like faith. Praise the Lord. That's a work of grace. It's a marvelous and wonderful thing in this world. And there are many examples. I think of a brother who joined one of our churches. I was guest preaching and he told me his life story. He had been years of church hopping and all kinds of crazy things happened in the various churches he was in. One time the pastor showed up and just locked the door and told people there was no more church. And I said to him, look, there's no perfect church. And he agreed, but he was deeply concerned that I not minimize the riches he had found by God's grace with us. We shouldn't minimize it either, but we should thank the Lord. And so to all of us, and to our graduates in particular, I may repeat the apostolic words of Colossians 2. The apostle says, I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ.
And therefore, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk in him. There's that same theme as your word is a light to my path. Walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. God's word is our light. That's the CRTS motto taken from Psalm 119, verse 105. I had the privilege back in July to teach eight young men in South Africa, all of whom we hope to receive in programs at CRTS in due time, very special time. And for five days, we studied intensively what God's Word says about good order in the church. That did not by far exhaust all the riches of Scripture about this, but we made a good start. And we finished with deep thankfulness to God that he did not leave us on our own in this important matter, simply to be pragmatists, but he has shone light on our path, also our path as churches. We have a way forward to maturity. The psalmist says in verse 45 of the same psalm, I will walk about in freedom, for I have sought out your precepts. I will walk about in freedom, for I have sought out your precepts. Precepts. What a wonderful attitude, bringing together exactly what God has put together. God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path as individual believers and as churches. Thank you.
now proceed to the conferral of the degree Master of Divinity, Chauncey James Connect. <clears throat> Chauncey, or Sean, loves languages. He uses English, Dutch, French, German, Afrikaans, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin in his research papers with remarkable facility. Sean came to us from the Niagara Peninsula with a deep interest in covenant theology and a very serious, deliberative demeanor. Beside him, when he was sitting down, is Emily, about whom he deliberated for only a minute, if that. <laughs> Courted her for maybe six months and then married her. And with a wedding on January 6, 2018, the Senate officially decided to let him in his class for the interim semester, for we didn't think they chose the date so that he could miss class, but simply because they love each other. <laughs> Their wedding was a wonderful testimony to the unity that we often wish we could enjoy with the free reformed churches of North America, whence Emily Hales. Sean and Emily are waiting to see what the Lord has in store next, but tonight they may celebrate with thanks to God that Chauncey has reached a major milestone. Mr. Principal, I present to you for the degree of Master of Divinity, Mr. Chauncey James Knack. On behalf of the Senate of the Theological College of the Canadian Reformed Churches, I confer on you, Chauncey James Connect, the Master of Divinity degree. Sean, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned.
Jeremy Edward Segstro. Jeremy hails from Winnipeg, Manitoba. He has a great love for the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and has great joy in encouraging others to trust in our Lord Jesus, whether for the first time or the thousandth time at the end of life. The devotions he wrote for his grandma testify to the latter and show his pastoral heart. Jeremy has worked hard at seminary, maybe harder than some because he absolutely loves being involved in every local ministry opportunity that he can, and that doesn't always leave a lot of time to write your papers. <laughs> He's also very forward-thinking. In every exam booklet, he would write on the inside cover exactly what mark he expected in each section and then add them up for the total. Shall we say that sometimes he's also a wonderful optimist? <laughs> Jeremy has accepted the call to serve the Canadian Reformed Church at Cloverdale, British Columbia as pastor. May the Lord bless you in that, brother. Mr. Principal, I present to you for the degree of Master of Divinity, Mr. Jeremy Edward Segstro. On behalf of the Senate of the Theological College of the Canadian Reformed Churches, I confer on you Jeremy Edward Segstro, the Master of Divinity degree. Jeremy, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them, so that all may see your progress. Janusz Sevastrovich. There are scholars, and then there are scholars among scholars. Philippe had learned not only ancient Hebrew before he came to CRTS, but also modern Hebrew, a double major, in fact. He had also been involved in a project reading the original faded writing of very old manuscripts of the New Testament that had been written over a second time, and he had to read the original. I remember that when Philippe was thinking of studying at CRTS, he was concerned that our MDiv might not be recognized in his homeland of Poland. Later tonight, you will learn this was, would not likely have been a problem. Philippe blogs in Polish and English and is a student for the ministry in the Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church, which has a church plant in Warsaw. Philippe may come across as quiet, but not when he preaches. His passion and his fine pastoral illustrations made his, his excuse me, it's really wonderful, his preaching and his chapel talks very dear to us. We are sad to see him go and we wish him God's blessing in all his endeavors. Mr. Principal, I present to you for the degree of Master of Divinity, Mr. Philippe Janusz of Ostrowicz. On behalf of the Senate of the Theological College of the Canadian Reformed Churches, I confer on you, Philippe Janusz Silvestrovich, the Master of Divinity degree. Philippe, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Meet Mark. 
this American man has a great handshake, looks you right in the eye, and you are certain that he is listening very caringly and wisely. His wife, Stephanie, also says that he is super handsome. <laughs> and their five children, Java, Bauer, Creed, Oslo, and Vigo, adore him. Mark is multi-talented. Besides earning a BA and, in about a moment, an MDiv, he also knows how to build walls, sidewalks, driveways, countertops, and coffee tables, and he can craft any one of those out of either concrete or hardwood. Take your pick. <laughs> I've heard that in his internships, the mentoring ministers always seemed to need a new patio. Perhaps he will build his own pulpit sometime, and he can, since he has accepted the call to serve the Providence Canadian Reformed Church of Edmonton as pastor. No pressure mark, but you do know that Providence's previous pastor, Reverend Aceman, served his church for 28 years, and he was the chairman of the board of CRTS. <laughs> Mr. Principal, I present to you for the degree of Master of Divinity, Mr. Mark Allen Tenhoff. On behalf of the Senate of the Theological College of the Canadian Reformed Churches, I confer on you Mark Allen Ten Hag, the Master of Divinity degree. Mark, do your, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Even though his dad, four of his uncles, and older brother are all ministers of the word, Nathan needs to be known for himself. He loves to read and quite enjoys blogging and discussing theology and culture online. Nathan came to CRTS with recent experience in the Alberta oil patch where he learned the need to defend his faith. His training at New St. Andrews College in Moscow, Idaho helped prepare him for this and for CRTS. After four further years of training with us, we see that Nathan is ready to serve the Church of Christ as pastor, and we wish him every blessing as he does so. Together with his dear wife Ashley and their daughter with the lovely name Haven Estelle, Nathan will soon move to Prince Edward Island to serve the United Reformed Church of PEI. Mr. Principal, I present to you for the degree of Master of Divinity, Mr. Nathan Stewart Beckfell. On behalf of the Senate of the Theological College of the Canadian Reformed Churches, I confer on you Nathan Stewart Zekfell, the Master of Divinity degree. Nathan, preach the word. Be ready, in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Make her wise, she came that way. 
before entering this all-male institution, at least at that time, now and then we have a young lady too, and the, we had another two, but, but this young lady wisely found herself a boyfriend. And this kept the relationships with the single guys in class much less complicated. <laughs> Leanna began in the diploma program, but soon asked to transfer into the bachelor program, which of course made no sense since she had just gotten married to that boyfriend a month before. Thank you. <laughs> I should have put a pun in here. <laughs> Leanna is bright, hardworking, articulate, but above all, she lives in the joy of the Lord. And she and her husband, Jordan, have been blessed with a boy named Salem and have moved to Woodstock, Ontario, so that Jordan, in time, can study for ministry at a new institution called Gillespie Divinity. Mr. Principal, I present to you for the degree of Bachelor of Theology, Mrs. Leanne, uh, Leanne and Annette Van Emeron. On behalf of the Senate of the Theological College of the Canadian Reformed Churches, I confer on you, Leanna Lynette Van Emeron, the Bachelor of Theology degree. Leanna by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you.
He applied to Edinburgh, St. Andrews, Cambridge, and Oxford, and he was admitted into all four. I'm overjoyed to tell you that he is entering graduate study this month with a fine supervisor, Dr. Simon Gathercole at Cambridge University. It testifies not only to CRTS's new accreditation status, but also to the fine abilities of our dear brother, all the way from Poland, Philip Sylvestrovich. Please come forward. This deserves 
some, some recognition. recognition. So thank you, Professor. For this. Now that's one example of the many changes that has come about in the last 50 years. Perhaps I should also speak about what probably hasn't changed. That ministers, that professors, seminary students were human beings. Normal people, aside from the whole jumping into trousers thing. <laughs> My fellow students wanted to share some memorable quotes and anecdotes from the past years, things that have helped to forge the bonds that we all have now. I can't say something about all of the students, but they've all been introduced to you just a moment ago. If you want to hear more about the things that didn't make the cut tonight, just ask at the reception following this ceremony. So first off, we all owe a great debt to Jeremy for his class notes. <laughs> he always created Google Docs, and these docs were created during lectures, and they recorded all of the proceedings. All of them. <laughs> and they also served as a platform for side debates and often you know, humorous commentary on the class discussions. During one discussion, one student, maybe it was probably me, kept hammering the same point, and an emoji of someone beating a dead horse was <laughs> inserted in the notes for all to see, and well, Eric lost control. <laughs> and actually had to leave the room because his laughter was ready to just explode out of his mouth. <laughs> Eric, that's right, probably one of the best students to ever go through our program. I mean, just ask him, he'll tell you. <laughs> no, that honor might actually have to go to Philippe for obvious reasons. Here's one reason. After a break in first year, Dr. Van Ralty asked, what Greek we had read over the break in order to stay fresh. And of course, everybody mumbled some excuse. And Philippe said, well, I read the entire Greek New Testament, but apart from that, nothing at all. <laughs> Philippe is a superhuman. <laughs> During one discussion in dogmatics, we were speaking about the nature of the soul and body relationship, and the following quote came, I think it was from Nathan, Adam was flesh from day one. Well, day six, I guess. <laughs> Another incident in dogmatics, as all past students know, our dear Dr. Van Vliet loves using graphs and charts and animations and diagrams in his PowerPoints, and they're very helpful. One such diagram featured arrows that portrayed a person's movement from one state to the other, so to the state of sanctification or something like that. And Chauncey was alarmed that the whole thing seemed rather Arminian, <laughs> and he said so. And so Dr. Van Vliet turned and pointed at the board and shouted, Chauncey, that is a Roman Catholic arrow. <laughs> this was overheard while a student was retrieving a very large stack of graded papers and quizzes. He said, you know, I'm feeling a little bit like Job, you know, getting all this bad news in one day. <laughs> So the first graduating class had Mrs. Sellis to check your cleanliness, and we have Catherine McKelsey. This is an actual email from Catherine. We probably received this email four or five times per semester, you know, times four years, so that's like 30 or 40 times. Hi guys, the sink and the counter are piling up with dirty dishes. If you can please clean them up, it would be appreciated. Also, there is a purple sandwich container that has been on the counter for two weeks. <laughs> can the owner please take it home? Catherine. That was one of the cheerful reminders. <laughs> and of course, we have to make mention of 
Leanna Van Amerongen, and her puns. Her puns are like perforated lines. They're terrible. <laughs> In all sincerity now, we have had a wonderful time together these past four years. We have all grown very close. We have borne each other's burdens. We have encouraged one another. We have prayed together. I've learned so much from each of you, and I know that I have truly been blessed by God to have spent all of this time with you. I am really going to miss you guys. Thanks be to God for all that he has done for us. It's impossible to share all of the ways that he has sustained us and provided for us during our time here. What grace and what love he has displayed. And we also give our deepest gratitude to all of you, all of you who have supported the seminary in all of your various ways, with your contributions, with your prayers, with your words of encouragement, we sincerely thank you, and we hope that you enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. Action is celebrating 50 years. 50 years of God's blessings to the seminary, to the Women's Savings Action, and to the seminary library. How did it all start? It takes a lot of money to institute and operate a school. And the League of Women's Societies in Ontario wanted to know, how can we help? 
they recognize that access to current, solid, reformed literature is essential to the operation of a seminary. They unanimously decided to organize the Women's Savings Action. It was established in 1969 with the purpose of purchasing books and periodicals for the library. In each Canadian Reformed congregation, the Women's Savings Action reps would collect pennies and loose change that were deposited into a special tin or even any homemade container. Then volunteers would spend evenings rolling and counting the change. At an annual convocation, a check might be presented to the principal for the seminary library. Giving and collecting continued, and in 1985, new facilities were purchased for the seminary. The Women's Savings Action collected $125,000 for the cost of this new building. Our books finally had a proper home, space for a real library. If you ever stop by the seminary, have a look at the plaque beside the library door. It acknowledges the contribution of the Women's Savings Action. In 1990, the women decided, let's build up a reserve. The library had expanded. By the year 2000, $80,000 had been collected. And with the Lord's blessing, the new library was officially opened on September 9, 2000. Over the years, funds have also been collected for various teaching aids, electronic upgrades, and computerization of the library. We acknowledge God's goodness to us over these past 50 years. God's goodness is given to us in our dedicated reps who faithfully encourage their brothers and sisters. They support the seminary library, and we are so thankful for these reps. You know, I really love our library. It's quiet, it's comfy, it's tired and worn in parts, but aren't all of us? Students spend hours here in the library, whether early in the morning or really late at night. <laughs> our, our students, they love our library so much that last year they gave it a 9.3 out of 10 rating. You know what, our seminary library, it, it's such a blessing to us. We have new translations of books that have been purchased translations that we can use a whole lot better in, in our preaching and in our teaching to apply it really to the people. We have access to literature that we didn't 20 years ago, that the newest books that are written by professors and ministers and scholars, they're there, right in hand's reach for the scholar or the student to grab and to use and apply. Here at CRTS, we're equipped and instructed by authors of the past and the present. And that's because we can never stop learning, we can never stop reading, we can never stop purchasing books. The library is such a vital part of the life of the seminary and the churches around us, and it needs ongoing support to continue to function. So we're so thankful for the support of the churches and the work of the Women's Savings Action. On behalf of the seminary, I thank you for your help and support. We couldn't do it without you. The WSA Women's Savings Action is absolutely vital to the existence and well-being of our library. As the associate librarian and a faculty member at the Canadian Reformed Theological Seminary, I urge you to support WSA fundraising. You know, nothing stands still. Ideas, Objections, defenses, they keep changing. Arguments shift and deepen. And that's why books, journals, databases, and commentaries, not to speak of technology, are constantly being updated, hopefully being improved, and definitely costing more money. Yet they're essential for what we do, much like new tools would be to a mechanic. They allow us to do efficient and up-to-date research. Over the past 50 years, the WSA has donated almost $1 million for the building, upgrading, and maintenance of our library. 
We have access to 33,000 print books, 64 periodical titles, and a brand new database called the Digital Theological Library. Now you need to know that academic books are expensive. The average cost per book in our library for the last while is $58. The annual cost of our database subscriptions is over $22,000. No modern library would be without these, least of all when serving master's level students. But exchange rates have not been in our favor and giving for the WSA has not kept pace with inflation. So you see we have challenges. That said, we are deeply thankful for what we have. It's really a wonderful resource. We even see students and professors from other institutions enjoying our library. We'd like to keep it that way, but we do need support. All the faculty and the students of the past 50 years are deeply appreciative of your support, and we deeply appreciate the love of the hardworking women of the Women's Savings Action. Thank you.
so you get to hear an Aussie accent again. After all, that cannot twang. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, tonight, it's a really my pleasure to introduce you to the CRTS uh, Male Choir. Um, tonight, it's after all these 50 years of, of celebrating the seminary, it's, it's a pleasure to be able to sing for you because singing has been, I think, it's fair to say, prized and treasured throughout 50 years uh, in the seminary as well. So tonight we'd like to sing two songs for you. The first is, is called Ma Navu, which is actually a Hebrew word. So we'll be singing in Hebrew, uh, just for a bit of fun. Uh, we have to do Hebrew all the time at seminary anyway, so we may as well sing in it. Uh, so we'll be singing, and it's from, based on the, the text in Isaiah 52 verse 7. How beautiful are the feet of those on the mountains who bring good news. And we'll also sing um, an arrangement of Psalm 119, which has been done for us by Martin Youngspa. I'm not sure if he's here tonight. Um, so, first of all, we'll sing Manavu, and also playing with us tonight is Rihanna Sla on the flute and Dr. Devissa on the piano. So, we hope you enjoy. Thank you.
at the end of this beautiful evening as we're able to reflect on the many blessings the Lord has given also to the churches through the seminary. We want to give all thanks and all praise to our God. So we will end this evening by calling on the name of the Lord and praising him for his blessings. Let us pray together. Almighty, heavenly God and Father, we lift up our voices this evening to praise and to magnify your holy name. Lord, we acknowledge you as the almighty God. Yes, the God who has created heaven and earth, but also the God who has created us in your very own image. You created us that we might acknowledge you, that we might worship and we might praise your holy name, that we may give honor and glory to you and to you alone. But Lord, we also acknowledge your grace towards us. We realize that we are disobedient people, people who with our first parents, Adam and Eve, transgress your holy will, that we make our own desires and our own needs first. And therefore, what a joy it is that also this evening that you speak to us. Yes, you speak to us through your holy word. For your word is a lamp to our feet. Your word is what gives to us our direction. Your word is what brings order into our lives. It brings order into our personal lives as you direct us in the way in which we may experience your blessings. You bring order into the life of your church so that we may also know how we may act as your people, how we may live together as brothers and sisters in the Lord, how we may together also worship and praise your holy name, and how together we may live as a bond of churches together. And so we thank you that also this evening, we may praise you as the Almighty God who has gathered together for yourself a people out of this world. And that also as Canadian Reformed churches, we may have this wonderful blessing that we may have that bond. But it's a bond that is based upon your Holy Word, a word that you have given to us through your, through your scriptures. But a word that is also proclaimed uh, through the mouths of faithful preachers of the gospel. And so we thank you for this institution of learning place where men are trained so that they might be able to expound your holy word faithfully and Lord we pray that you may then also continue to watch over the seminary watch over the work that is continues to, to be carried out in this place that it may be richly blessed by, your, by you and by your spirit so that also the men who are trained may, may go out into, into the world and may go out into your churches and, and there be busy with the work you've given them to do. And so this evening we give you our thanks uh, that there are also a number of men who have graduated uh, with their Master of Divinity and therefore have also prepared themselves to be ministers of the Word. But Lord, we also know that it's not only a matter of having a degree, but also that you're the one who calls men to the ministry. And so this evening we give you our thanks uh, that our brothers Chauncey Kneff, Eric Underwater, Jeremy Segstro, Mark Tenhoff, Nathan Zegbelt, and Philip Zilvestrovich are able to also receive their Master of Divinity this, this evening. That they also can see four years of work being crowned in, in this way. Lord, we thank you for uh, the fact that you have watched over them and that you have blessed them also in their studies and that they could also achieve uh, the degrees that they have received. Oh Lord, we also thank you for Leanna Van Amerongen that she too is able to receive her Bachelor of Theology. Lord, we ask that you will remember each one of these students as they go forward in their calling. Be with uh, Chauncey and Emily. Oh Lord, also surround with your care as uh, they wait to, to just see uh, what doors might open and where you might call them also in the future. We pray that you would give them wisdom but also patience during this time and that you may bless them. We pray that you be with our brother Eric and his wife Lisa as 
Lord willing, they will take up uh, their, his, uh, will take up his calling in, in Brampton. Uh, Jeremy Sigstro takes up his calling, Lord willing, in the church of Cloverdale, Martin Hoff, uh, that he may take up his work in, in Providence, Edmonton, together, that they may go there, that he may go there with his wife Stephanie. Are we also pray for Nathan Zeckfeldt and his wife Ashley as they will soon take up their work in the United Reformed Church in Prince Edward Island. Lord, we pray that you'll also be with the, these men as uh, they prepare themselves for classes exams and that things may go well and that they may be uh, soon ordained as ministers of your word in these respective churches. We pray for our brother Philip Zilvestrovich as he also begins his uh, so, continues his studies at Cambridge University of England and bless him also in his work there. We'll be with Leanna Van Emmerong and her husband as uh, her husband also continues his studies and we pray Lord uh, that you might also bless them. We give you our thanks uh, for the work of the professors. Lord we're thankful that they're able to also begin their work again in this new semester in, in good health and strength. Sometimes also the burdens that are placed upon them are heavy and the expectations can be, can be much. And so we pray that, that you will give them wisdom and strength. That they may do their work well. And that they may be a blessing to the men and those whom, to whom they give instruction. Lord, we're thankful for our, student, for our student body. Remember, especially also those new students who will begin a new program of study this year. Lord, we pray that also their transition to the seminary life may be a good transition. Also be those who have come back and will continue their studies. We pray that all the students may receive what they need to do well academically. But more importantly, Lord, we ask that they may grow in awe and love and commitment to you as their Lord and as their God. We also give you our thanks this evening for the work of the Women's Savings Action as they support uh, also with funding of the needs of the library. Lord, we thank you for the library that the seminary has that is able to also help the students in, in their work and the professors in their teaching. And we, we thank you, Lord, that the women also of the past 50 years have done so much uh, to support the library so that proper resources could be available uh, for this important work. We pray that you will continue to also make the women in this way a blessing uh, to the seminary community. Lord, we pray for the bond between the seminary and the supporting churches. We thank you that there is a good support among the churches, uh, that there is support also spiritually as the needs are remembered in prayer, and also as the churches support this work financially. We pray, Lord, also for the churches in Australia and South Africa, and that also the bonds that we have there may continue to grow, and that we, as a seminary, may be a blessing also in those churches as well. Lord, we pray that the seminary may be a blessing throughout the world. As many come to also study from different parts of the world, uh, that also in that way the Reformed faith and, and the truths of your gospel uh, may spread to the ends of the earth. We pray that you will then also bless the offering that was uh, taken and that was given for the publication fund. Lord, we thank you that we have professors who uh, dedicate themselves to study who also are publishing different materials that are a help for, this, uh, for the work that they do in the classroom, that also are, is, is beneficial for the, well, for the well-being of your churches. Oh Lord, we pray that also through this publication fund, uh, many new books and manuscripts might be published uh, for the well-being and the edification of your people and of your church. And so Lord, we come to the end of this evening. We want to give you thanks. We want to praise you for the many blessings that you've given to us. That also this evening we could hear many words spoken. But under all those words, we remember that you're the God who is with us. You're the Father who supports us. And that when we also go from this place, that we do not go alone. But that your everlasting arms are always under us, ready to carry us, ready to direct us. So that we may then also, uh, truly also, believe, and in faith we may go forward, trusting that you provide, and that you will care for each one of us. But Lord, we ask that you will then also be with us as we leave this place. Watch over us, keep us safe in our travels, and we pray that you will grant us your blessing for the sake of your Son. 
in whose name we pray. Amen. There's one announcement. Some of you who come from the Niagara Peninsula will want to return home. As you return home, you should be aware that the, that the Alexander Link is closed, Niagara bound. Uh, so uh, if you try to take, to take the link, you may not get home tonight. Um, so you may want to uh, think of some alternate ways to, to, to get to your home. Um, you should also uh, be thinking about that if you are going to come to the open house at the, the seminary building uh, tomorrow. But the uh, community, the seminary staff, uh, community is eagerly looking forward to, to receiving you. If you all come, they would be more than happy if all of you came. But if you come tomorrow, um, also remember that the link will continue to be closed in Niagara Bound, so you'll have to find some alternate way uh, home from the seminary. Let us now, to, to, in closing, stand and sing together, O Canada.